We're live. We are live. We're live. All right, I'm going to share all the links and then we're going to get started. Share all the links and let's do this thing. As soon as it's, I have the links, here we go. I'm seeing it. Now I can mute us and share. Cool. Okay, man. <laughs> what, what's your excuse for not looking like this? <laughs> Yeah, show us your Lacan tattoo. Oh, yeah, I can make it dance. Everyone needs to see it. That's a little pre-recording treat for anyone who's early on the YouTube stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we're... I can barely, like... I don't even listen to episodes anymore. Of, um, of our pod? I yeah. don't either. I can only yeah. imagine um, trying to watch the video <laughs> version of it. <laughs> I just get um, in fact I don't it. even I, I don't even remember what we talk about after we talk about it when it's like, done it's done done it's done baby yeah I was trying to listen to it but it cringes me out to hear my own voice like that why you have a lovely voice yeah but I, it's funny because I used to listen to every episode we did and then for some reason, starting with the rise on one, I can't listen to him anymore. Interesting. I just always feel like I'm dumb. Like I'm saying dumb shit. Well, I think we are dumb when it comes to Deleuze. I'm not going to lie. We I feel all, really dumb. We are all dumb when it comes to Deleuze. Yeah. <laughs> the fact people come to us for guidance. Truly the, truly the blind following the blind. <laughs> Are we are we gonna do this thing or what? I, I got I got one more post to make and then we can start recording on our other zooms. <sighs> yeah. We'll just do this. Watch now. This is yeah, my computer is going slow too. We really need like an animation. Um, well, yeah. Hold on, Carla. Okay. Oh, Carla. We're ready. Crap. What, did Carla the, open the door? Well, it's <laughs> the perfect timing for Carla to give me a glass of wine. Oh. <laughs> keep, before, keep yelling at your lady. Before we start the official business. Keep yeah, yelling. All, all of the people on the YouTube live get to watch me yell at my girlfriend. <laughs> Carla. Carla. <laughs> oh, Carla. Nope, she can't hear me. Oh, well. You, you could text her. Fuck it. She can come in. She can just walk in while we're recording. <laughs> yeah yeah she should make a cameo okay should we oh, she will, yeah. should we do the countdown we're ready mm -hmm. three two one go okay okay three two one go cool we're recording we're back we're back it's tuesday night it's 8 p.m ish that means it's time for another live trash talks yeah, we're talking Deleuze again. Well, D&G, d, &G, d, &G again. We're back on Deleuze and Guattari. We do not promote Guattari erasure on this podcast. We always say the whole thing, d, &G, d <laughs> or Dolce & Gabbana, a nice stand-in that I like to think about. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, okay, so actually I was listening to another podcast today on d and uh, called Acid Horizons. And they, before, they, before they, we get... No, no, Okay, go they, ahead. They, they, they pronounced it Guattari. Guattari? What am yeah. oh, I saying it? <laughs> Gua, Gua, Guattari. I assumed it was Guattari. Yeah, I don't know. I'm learning French just so I can learn how to pronounce his name. <laughs> I'll just call him G. We should just call him G. Yeah, I like you. D and G, I think, is good shorthand. And it's mm -hmm. very effective. Yeah, add together, but I'm saying like individually, we can also call them, you know, just G or just D. Just G and just D. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Trash Talks, the only critical theory podcast for people who have had sex before. 
If you're listening to a different theory podcast, <laughs> turn it the fuck off. <laughs> Correct. Um, <laughs> um, this is the second part on our series, Reading Through to Losing Guitar is Thousand Plateaus. Confusingly enough, part two of our series is chapter five of the book on several regimes of science. Yeah, so um, not only are we... We started with part two of a series, right? So we have Anti-Oedipus, which is part one. We decided not to read that. Go straight no. into part two. And then we went from the intro straight to chapter five, so. Well, I was doing some research this week and I have a justification for why we're skipping Anti-Oedipus um, and just going straight into Thousand Plateaus that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Is um, Anti-Oedipus is a negative project. You can, See, that's you can what... trace a sort of, you can trace a sort of lineage of Deleuze and it's a negative project criticize, of criticism based on his ontology and metaphysics. And with Thousand Plateau, we have the positive aspect. That is according to the reader, the, uh, like the accompanying reader that, that we've also been reading. But I mean, according to the, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, to tell you I've been stepping out on you Woody and I've been reading Anti-Oedipus on my own. Oh, how dare you. <laughs> um, but there's a there's an intro in here that's really good that says actually that Anti-Oedipus is um it's healing. It's it's not a, not only is it diagnostic but it also heals us. So I Maybe. don't know. I yeah. had some problems with it. I don't think, I mean, I don't know enough about it to really criticize it, but I don't really think that the Oedipal figure is as central to psychoanalytic uh, theory anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. In although... fact, most, most like contemporary Lacanian theorists kind of distance themselves from the Oedipal complex. Prob probably because of these works by D&G, no? Uh, for a lot of reasons. It's like off-putting to people who aren't already in the know. And it's kind of like, you know, the knee-jerk reaction to Freud is sort of like, this guy just said you want to fuck your mom, you know? Yeah. It's true. a little alienating. You save it for later. True, true, true. Start with desire. Talk about the lack. <laughs> Although, I mean, okay, also I learned today that, that that lack, that idea of lack doesn't come from Lacan. Desire comes from lack. That comes from Plato, Plato. actually. Yeah. Yeah, we both. <laughs> yeah, but... um. A lot of things come from a lot of places. Technically, dialectics comes from the Greeks, but you would still make a distinction of Hegelian dialectics. I'm going to argue that dialectics comes from the Chinese, but you know what? Actually, we should just argue that origins don't matter. That's true. Let's oh. be true Deleuzians and abandon such a linear way of thinking. Yeah, fuck a genealogy. Fuck a genealogy. I'm not trying to look <laughs> back at history for shit. We're not making tracings, we're making <laughs> maps. This is a map, new forms, new, um, <laughs> new uh, assemblages, lines of flight. Oh my um, God. The creation of new possibilities. I love, this is like our like lingo. This is like the hip new lingo for this pod. <laughs> 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 yeah, all the kids walking up to each other on TikTok and being like, What's up, dude? You got any fresh lines of flight recently? <laughs> yeah. 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 I want to hear about machinic desire. Yeah, tell me tell me about that abstract machine, baby. Oh yeah. yeah, I have to send you this thing I found that's um a like really early Guattari thing, uh paper where he's writing about the machinic unconscious. Nice. I think it's helpful. Maybe we should do a bonus episode on it. Yeah, I've I, I've it's read short. I read somewhere, I don't remember where now, that like um, there's a very like militant thread that runs through capitalism and schizophrenia and that come from Felix. We're gonna, let, we should just go on like a first name basis. <laughs> Felix, yeah, yeah, yeah. Except if we wanna talk about like the difficulty of pronunciation, what is it, Giles? Yeah, yeah. so we'll call, we'll, maybe it's Felix and Deleuze for us. Or is it Giles? <laughs> Giles, Deleuze? Giles, Giles. 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 <laughs> Yeah, De Deleuze, pronounce it like Spanish. Deleuze and Felix sound like two guys I want to hang out with. Yeah. Um, but wait, uh, a little housekeeping. If you're listening to this on the podcast version, we've actually been doing uh, live video streaming of us recording, um, and we've been pretty consistently doing it Tuesday night around 8 o'clock. 
Yeah, so you can interested. see the signifiers coming straight from our face. <laughs> Faces. Yeah, the, the important thread that runs through the whole podcast is how hot and dumb we are. So you can see our hot, dumb faces. Hold on. Hello. Hi, you want some wine? Yes, I would. Aw. Hi, Carla. Sorry for all the uh, theater of the mind. My girlfriend, Carla, just brought me a glass of wine. Oh, she, I just realized she couldn't hear me because you have headphones on. But, but. She didn't know, and I'll never tell her. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and like yeah. a good girlfriend, she refuses to listen to the pod, so she'll just never know. Yeah, like a good girlfriend, she would never listen to my podcast, and I would never <laughs> want her to. God forbid. Um, how do people find the stream of the video, Lana? Um, on our YouTube. Our YouTube is Trash Talks. But then we post a link on our Twitter. Yeah, right? the link's on, on our Twitter. On uh, You can join our Facebook group, um, which Trash is Trash Talks Academy, Academy. Which is and just also a lot of fun. We post memes. We have a good time. Yeah, it's fun. Um, and, and it's the funnest thing on Facebook. I log on just for the um, it is, the, the lose memes and for the Trash Talks Academy. It is literally the only thing I do on Facebook is just fuck around in that group. We've yeah. got a good little culture we've grown for ourselves. We're working on it. And then we also post the uh, the link to our Patreon, and we are also doing more Patreon only episodes. So, yeah. yeah, I have dedicated. We will all of the Deleuze episodes will be free, but we are doing episodes on other topics uh, that are going on the Patreon still. Yeah, um, I know this is the pandemic, but if you like the show, <laughs> think about subscribing. Flo is <laughs> tears just a buck a month. Wow, what a deal and uh or and or or and you could leave us um a review on apple Podcasts. yeah which is easy great. way to support the show subscribe leave us a five-star review on it on uh apple podcasts if yeah. you leave us a five-star review we'll read it on the show or yeah, only us give us a review if it's a good review if it's a bad review just get out of our if it's a bad it. review save that shit for yourself no yeah. one wants to hear it write that in your fucking gratitude journal or whatever write oh. it on a bullet and then use the bullet to kill yourself <laughs> you have bad taste you can just tweet at us or whatever you want to yeah do. slide to my dms and tell me i suck it's my fetish <laughs> yes yeah Ooh, that's I or yeah, very that. simply just tell your friends say hey there's a little podcast that like yeah anyway that's um nice and yeah shameless. our tw our twitter has also been like i've been on our twitter i no longer tweet yeah. on my own account i've just i've been going full what i've i've now coined a new term adorno mode it's, yeah you've, uh, been, you've been wilding out on the twitter i'm not gonna it, lie it's when i get really angry and i just start critiquing the culture um, what's been in the crosshairs of you on twitter i've seen a lot of animal crossing you know, I've, 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 after the end of our last episode, I just like have been in like a kind of like continuous rage about um, Animal Crossing that just like keeps <laughs> getting fueled. Um, and also just video games in general. People, Which is a, a good take. I'm always, I've always been anti video gaming, but I know it's dangerous position for a podcast to hold considering the people who pay for podcasts are the same people who play video games. Yeah, but we're hot and dumb and we hate video games. Yeah, I couldn't but, imagine a more significant waste of time. Uh, yeah, see, the thing is, is that I feel like video games are dangerous, like not at all for the reason that Hillary Clinton told us that video games were dangerous back in the 90s. Like, I, I'm not concerned about like the first person shooter games. I'm concerned about these cute games that present themselves as completely um innocuous mm -hmm. those are the games we should truly be watching out for i mean i i have a more general position that they're they're boring and they make you boring that's also true that's there's only true. there's only so many hours in the day and if you spend them gaming you're not going to learn a, a valuable skill or maybe uh read to lose <laughs> Yeah, I actually, I have a, I have a Deleuze, I have a D&G critique of video games, which is that um, the problem with video games is that they are completely in charge of your desiring production, right? Because uh. unless you're playing games like Second Life or Minecraft, which I would have to re-examine, but other games where they're, you are told what the benchmarks are, or you are working towards some arbitrary goal, which is defined by the video game, that I, I can imagine, yeah, nothing like more 
fucking in control of someone's desiring production. <laughs> yeah, my more like in-depth criticism of video games uh, that we can maybe get into deeper if we ever end up doing that in cell one, in cell episode is um, the reprogramming of your brain towards like gamification of uh, successive dopamine release. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what's so crazy and scary and nefarious about Animal Crossing is that it literally is just like neoliberalism in a game, but cute and orientalized. And there's some, and it includes this DIY aspect where you, you think that you're like expressing your identity, right? Yeah. How many when things it, are you going to describe as cute and orientalized this week? Oh, well, it's because it's because my brain. OK, so I've learned from this chapter that we read. We'll get into it later. But I'm a monomaniac. Really? So, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I like get on certain topics and I just like I see it everywhere. You know, what I, mean? I just get, become obsessed. And so it, um, I've been really into animation theory lately. Oh, very and cool one of the and animation theory is super new if anyone's curious about it you can look into uh we don't have a daddy of animation theory we actually have a mommy of animation theory her name is terry silvio um yeah she came out this is so new that like you can't even really google that much about it but you can um look her up and read her book that she just came out with at the end of last year like puppet gods and something i don't know look up terry silvio Anyways, one of the characteristics of animation is cuteness. And I, so I've been thinking for a long time, like, what is this cuteness about? And then I realized cuteness is like the most dangerous thing because it presents itself as completely unthreatening, innocuous, uh, simple, young, unthreatening. And so we, are, we then like take those things and we like bring them close into us, which is I think the kind of impulse when you see something cute. And so it's almost like a Trojan horse. It is well, a Trojan horse. <laughs> we, we, have a, we have an impulse towards cuteness. And it's like, um, it's an instinct based on like finding babies to be cute and endearing because it stops us from just bashing their little heads on rocks and instead like coddling oh. them until the age where they can actually fend for themselves. And so then like cute things and animated things imitate baby-like characteristics of like having large heads or like, large eye to head ratios and it triggers things in our brain that like we're looking at something we want to care for and love like baby yoda i will die for that baby it is triggering things in me chemicals See, are being fired there is okay so i also don't think it's a coincidence that as the world becomes more fascist we have more cute things ah. Is not, I would love a sort of like not a coincidence. A new wave of a sort of kawaii fascism of like uh, as we get more AR and like augmented reality, there's like anime schoolgirls that are telling me I have to like meet my daily quota in the salt mines or else I'll like be docked. Yeah, no, I I feel like that's gonna be that's the future, man. That's what we're headed towards. And God bless us. I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, if I'm going to be controlled, at least, like, make it cute and orientalized. That's make like, it kawaii. I want make it, it that kawaii. way. Make it kawaii. Make it kawaii. Yeah. <laughs> enough. Enough of that nonsense. Anyways, yeah, let's get to the matter at hand. Some yeah. news, actually, for you, Woody, is that we, I think we might be able to have um, an a Delusian expert on the show next week who all, she um her name is Elizabeth shout out to Elizabeth and she wrote her dissertation on anarchism and Deleuze so very fun that might next, go up on the P -P -P Patreon Patreon yeah so hopefully we can have her on next week okay. to explain explain Deleuze Anyways, to us shall we get into it yeah, it's an interview. With, it's an interview with only one question, and the question is: Explain to us, or I'll fucking kill you. What's the body with pet organs? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. All right. So um, we chose on several regimes of signs, and the reason why we chose it is because I was thumbing through this book and I saw these fucking pictures, yeah. these diagrams, and I love, I love me a diagram and a and a picture. So I think it's appropriate too, because I would say. 
one of the niches of this show, maybe our area of specialty that we're going to give you just that little bit better than anyone else is semiotics. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I, I, okay. I might be, I may be dumb and hot, but I know semiotics pretty fairly well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We yeah, know our yeah. shit. When it I know, comes to yeah. the exchange of signs and sign systems, we're the fucking masters, baby. Yes. Um, so yeah, this is a good <laughs> one. I want to give a little warning. If folks are reading it uh, along with us or attempting to, and they're finding it difficult and maybe they're getting frustrated or alienated it's okay it's a difficult book it's hard i this is actually this is the first time that i've read something since i graduated from grad school and have like felt frustrated because it's so difficult yeah i mean because it's it's like so it's a it's so counterintuitive in so many ways because it's like the positive project of creating something out of a metaphysics that is not our like usual metaphysics that we kind of take for granted. Exactly. And thus it's like a lot of times up is down and just it, it's it's grounded in something that's completely unfamiliar to us. Well, we can't find the ground. That's the difficulty. So I think that I think that finding the ground with the lose will or, or, well, excuse me, with the NG will come when we read more. I yeah, think that the, it's just, the, I think it's one of those things that you just kind of have to have faith and like you also have to understand that all of this chapter what it's doing is creating a lot of connection or it's creating a lot of like openings but not necessarily connecting for us yet right yeah yeah, yeah. I mean I like to think of the the process of reading something like this as sort of like a struggle right you're not necessarily reading and taking information from it directly as much as you're like struggling with the ideas that they're presenting to you and like seeing what you can wrestle out of them that makes sense. I just I so in the in terms of like a DNG machine, a machine always has is all is all about connections. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, all yeah. about flows. like yeah, flows. Connections of flow. But the mouth connects to the straw and the flow of the soda goes in. That's yeah, exactly. Machine. Exactly. Or the mouth connects to the dick or whatever. <laughs> the mouth connects to the dick. Someone, uh, someone, I pay someone to pee into my mouth. The urine connects to me. Yeah, the capital um, connects to her. Mm -hmm. Flows, desiring machines, production of desire. Exactly. So I kind of, I kind of see this chapter like diving into D and G and reading a chapter almost as like creating all of these like um, sort of like holes. Like I wouldn't even say that they're like touchstones. They're just like holes that are like about to be hooked up to other machines, but we haven't like read about the other machines yet, so we don't see those connections yet. But we're like our our rhizome is like growing. Yeah, because each plateau or chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, connects to various other chapters in the book in various ways, which we'll kind of get into. And yeah. I want to say just one last note on uh, reading technique. Uh, if all else fails, which I'm not going to lie, the last like 10 pages of this chapter, I got it, it made no fucking sense to me whatsoever. Just let it wash over you. Yeah, no, that's such a good, that's such a good um, reading technique. Another one, so, okay, apparently in- Very, uh, uh, Deacon, very Derrid Derridian. Oh, really? Yeah, so apparently in Difference in Repetition, which is like modified from Deleuze's uh, PhD dissertation, he uh -huh. says in the introduction to just read the conclusion that you like don't need to read any of the book. <laughs> <laughs> which I fucking love as soon as I like as soon as I learned that I actually last week I told my students I'm like or no two weeks ago I was like did you guys read the conclusion first no like do that always read the conclusion first and then work backwards it's a good strategy that is um, honestly a pretty fucking good strategy that's uh that's not really that doesn't work with this chapter this book but um in a lot of other cases yeah and, damn that's almost <laughs> as good as when Baudrillard references something and there's a footnote and when you look at the footnote he says that he made it up <laughs> or my favorite uh, Baudrillard my favorite Baudrillard footnote uh this occurred to me in a dream amazing yeah sure why so the good. fuck not 
yeah you should be able to cite yourself fuck it yeah or uh, like cite like random he, shit he's so it. good uh, sig- sig- uh, simulation and simulacrum famously starts with a quote from Ecclesiastes that isn't actually a quote from Ecclesiastes. He just says it is. Hell yeah. That, rem- that reminds me of like, uh, so in the Society of the Spectacle, Debord ha- has a quote about plagiarizing and how we should just like plagiarize everything. And then that quote was actually plagiarized from somewhere else. Yeah, very good. The French are amazing. But anyways, all right, let's get into it. Let's get into it. All right, on several regimes of signs. On several regimes of signs. Yeah. So what do you think they mean by a regime of signs? Because there's several things that it is not. Um, well, they say that a regime of signs is one, any specific formalization of expression. Yes. So they they make a distinction between two different things, which they call the form of expression and the form of content. Yeah. And forms forms of expression can be things like speaking is a form of expression through signs, but also something like dance or Mm -hmm. painting being a form of expression. And like, so when they're saying regimes of signs or sign systems they're not limiting it to language it shouldn't be confused with being like a purely linguistic function right which is so this is very much a critique of Saussure in that sense because so Saussure Ferdinand is Saussure and um what he calls semiology is and really structuralism as well grows out of this is all based on language. So that yeah. means that like the linguistic, the signifying, so, or what D&G would call um, the signifying regime is the top. It's like basically what every, everything is derivative of that. Will you, before we keep, will you give us a quick, quick rundown of signs signifier signified? Yeah, okay, so, all right, yeah. So before we start this chapter, we should say semiotics, there are two forms, there are two, kinds of semiotics, right? There is what is sometimes referred to as semiology, which is generally, um, it comes from Europe, specifically it comes from Saussure, and it comes specifically from language. And he says that the word, so a word, which is a sign, is um, made of two parts, which is a signifier and a signified. And so the whole sign is a signifier and signified. For instance, when I say tree, that means the concept tree. Uh-huh. And then now yeah. this system is opposed to what the, uh, the, we, the signifier being like the materiality of the word itself. Like the right. marks on the page are the signifier. The concept of a tree is the signified. Well, so, so technically, I mean, technically, right. Sassur would not say that. So technically, Sassur says that the signifier is an image acoustique, which is. Uh, he says that in your mind, because he, he also, so Saussure also says that uh, writing is derivative of the spoken language, and that's where Derrida comes in and does this whole critique of Saussure. That's a different story. Yeah, d and also plot. had a really good point on this that was like um, all, all written texts involve an oral tradition, but that like the function of writing uh, pays into uh, bureaucratic empires. Yeah, the whole bureaucracy aspect. They're clearly obsessed. So D and D. They're so obsessed with bureaucracy. They're obs- no, they're obsessed with Kafka. They wrote. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. obsessed with the trial, right? And Ka- well, Kafka more broadly. But they actually well, they wrote, wrote a whole book on Kafka. Yeah, in between writing anti Oedipus and a thousand plateaus. Uh-huh. Okay, so but to go back to Saussure, so the signifier is an image acoustique so what that means is basically like the sounds but he says it's the sounds of a word as we imagine it in our minds as like a an acoustic image okay so um d and g are all about pragmatics right so this is actually so which so is another word like for the schizoanalysis, so, which is another word for rhizomatics. They're all the same. Y- yeah, well, they put a bunch of equal signs in, um, yeah, in the introduction, right? It was, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what's interesting is that pragmatics is a, the only philosophy to come out of America. 
right? And um, one of the uh, greatest pragmatists is C.S. Peirce, Charles Sanders Peirce, who we've talked about before on this podcast. And he uh, came up with a whole different conception of the sign, totally different from Saussure. So Saussure privileges language. Um, and he actually, he also privileges long over parole. And so that's which so, means <laughs> so long, long is the abstract system of language, which kind of like this sort of universe, this idea of universal grammar that we have in our head or like, um, yeah, how we, yeah, this like idea of what is right or wrong when it comes to language that exists in our head and that guides our choices about how we speak. And then yeah. parole is actual speech. And, um, and they use this word a lot in this chapter, enunciation. So whenever you see the word enunciation, that refers to, um, I wouldn't say a speech act, but an act of speaking. Well, um, when they're talking about subjective enunciation and the subject of the statement, they're, they're talking also about Lacan. Um, yeah. That's, that's like a, a Lacan thing of like the split subject and the subject of the statement. So well, we can get to that. But that, that the subjective thing, but enunciation in general, especially for um, the French, enunciation is any, uh, any sentence that is spoken out loud. Yes. Um, and I have a question, which we can just, I'll just pose now and we can table it for later, which is what is the difference between expression and enunciation? I don't know. Okay, but to go back to, Charles Sanders Peirce and um, uh, pragmatics is like what this chapter is making moves with is so C.S. Peirce he wrote this um, famous article that's called logic as semiotic and he says that the sign is actually made of three parts you have the representamen the object and the interpretant so for instance, um, the representamen would be like, I point my finger and then the object is what I'm pointing at. And the interpretant is you turning your head to look at what I'm pointing at. Yeah. If I'm like, look out behind you. <laughs> right. Or, and or I'm pointing. And yeah. you, follow my, you follow my finger to see what I'm pointing at. But Perth is very complicated in that he, it's like, it's very much fractal. So he has like three part distinctions for all of these different things. So he also has icon index symbol, right? So the pointing would be an index. Um, a symbol is something that's completely arbitrary. So that's what um, Sewer says that all signs are actually arbitrary. The, no, actually, sorry. He says the link between the signifier and signified is arbitrary. Um, so that means that a word is a symbol. And then there's also icon. So for instance, a blueprint a blueprint is going to be an eye. So for instance, if I have a blueprint of this room, the representant is the blueprint, the object is this room, and the interpretant totally depends on context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interpretation. Okay. Yes, okay, so. Good. Uh, we did a whole two whole episodes on semiotics. Um, you can go back and review if this piques your little interest. <laughs> um, but yeah, so when they're, they're talking about, when they say regimes of signs, they don't just mean linguistic signs though. They're opening right. more up. Right, so they're taking the Persian view of semiotics. They're taking the American pragmatic Persian view of semiotics, which does not privilege language over any other regime of sign. Yeah, so the regimes of signs are kind of ways of ordering expression, one might yeah. say. Right. or ways of ordering um, meaning, the ways, ways of linking meanings. Right. Um, and so in this chapter, they delineate four different regimes of signs, the pre-signifying, the signifying, the post-signifying, and the counter-signifying. Yes. But the main focus is going to be on the middle two, uh, the signifying and the post-signifying, um, what they say about the pre-signifying in brief is that it's regimes of signs and meaning dealing more territorially. Um, and we're going to return to those in the chapter on faciality and the chapter on capture. And then the post 
the counter signifying is uh, like connected to nomadology in the war machine, which we'll get back to in the nomadology chapter whenever we get to that one. And that has more to do with numbers and like movements of numbers. And what's important about those two in brief is that uh, the pre-signifying resists the state apparatus uh, before it exists and the counter-signifying um, attacks the state apparatus. Oh yeah, it's warlike, right? Yeah, it's, um, it, it attacks, it destroys. The war machine. The war machine, baby. We like that, that's the militant line that we like. Yeah, <laughs> and so the signifying and the post-signifying. And again, another thing that this isn't, because it's a lot of, it's a lot easier to say what things aren't than what they are in D&G, is this is not a historical analysis. Yeah. It's, it's not, not to say that there was first one regime and then there was another. It's, they're all mixed. They're always mixed. They're always mixed in particular ways. One exists simultaneously with the other, often at the same time or combined with each other. And so it's not a historical analysis of how language moves and signs move. And it's also not precise. These regimes are constructs. They say that very explicitly at the beginning. This is like, uh, if language and signs can even really be studied independent of other factors, because at the beginning they want to talk about like, what does it even mean to talk about language without the face? Right. Like, what is it to speak without imagined faces? But like, it, it's an ex this whole chapter is an exercise in trying to separate things out. Right. Um, and I think, but I also think that there's, maybe this can be read into this chapter, which is that it seems that certain societies definitely privilege one type of regime over another. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's something that they, that's kind of points that they use as metaphors to explain different things. No, D&G like, D &G hate metaphors though. Okay, you're right, yeah, they, <laughs> they, they embody it. They, or, yeah, they hate, they hate metaphors. More so within certain historical formations, one regime or the other is more imminent, as they would say. Mm. They yeah. love imminence. Uh, they love, it becomes more intense. And in fact, this right, is like, I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. forgot <laughs> to mention at the beginning, um, each plateau in Thousand Plateaus has a date on it. And yeah. that date is representative of moments in history that they think this plateau was the most imminent or had the most of intensity. And this one is um, 587 BC and 8070, which is referring to the first and second destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Yeah, so I feel like the one, like maybe the regime of signs that's most intense in this chapter is the signifying regime. Well, I'd well say or the passional. Yeah, cause yeah, they, post signifying. Because yeah. they use like the history of the, like Jewish people, like Moses and them, as like the the example of what the post signifying regime is, and that's why like the two destructions of the temples of Jerusalem, first by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, was like changes. Uh, let's uh, anyway. Let's let's define these things before we start trying to like apply them to yeah. various things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's um okay. so the signifying regime of signs is all can also be thought of as the des the despotic regime, a regime with a despot. And the despot is a signifier. Think of the signifying regime as a sort of spiral or a series of concentric circles going outwards. And at the very center of all of these circles is the king, the despot, or the master signifier, is I think that they never say that specifically in this chapter, but it's impossible not to think about it. Um, and within the signifying regime, signs rotate around the master signifier. They rotate around the despot. They're always referring to other signs, but at some degree, they're also always referring to the signifier that's in the center and which gives the meaning to the whole system. 
so okay, far so, so good. So I think this is really important is how they combine this um, Sasurian concept of um, a sig like a signifying regime, which is just signifier and signified with what they with what uh, Peirce would call like some sort of uh, like infinite chain, right? Because like yeah. according to Peirce is like, so when so you have a representation that's pointing to an object which gives you an interpretant but the interpretant itself is another sign which that which is another a representation and an object and so like you're like caught in this like forever chain um so I think yeah. that's like the really good that's what they do that's so good about putting Sasur and Purse together they say like oh with words actually you can never get to meaning because we're like in this like infinite regression of meeting this infinite like uh I mean, chain a this is this it's it, it's also a Lacanian reference. They're tying into Lacan, okay? Because for Lacan, it's also a sign refers to another sign. Um, it said uh, a signifier is something that represents the subject to another signifier. There never really is a point where it goes directly to a signified. It's like the sig the signifiers refer to other signifiers, refer to other signifiers, refer to other signifiers. And the signified is something that's sort of like below, but the signifiers shift constantly over the top of them. There's never a hard connection between the words and the objects in the world as much as there is like a shifting reference. That's like very Lacanian. All right, let me, um, let me read a quote. This is page 112. So the role of the signified, it continually glides beneath the signifier for which it serves only as a medium or wall. The specific forms of all contents dissolve in it. Contents are abstracted. Yeah. Yeah. So there's it's it's which is a very counterintuitive thing. We'll, we'll be, if you haven't been spent too much time reading about different theories of semiotics, because you think that a word like tree, right, it, it corresponds to something like a real tree out there in the world. But we want you to think about the idea that when you say tree, your mind is just thinking of different signs, different image signs, word signs, sound signs, and there's just a chain of unbroken signs that don't have that much to do with the thing it's connecting to out in the world. And I think this is like, this is why, so don't they connect the signifying regime with, yeah, they call it paranoid. Here's another really good quote. I love this. This is like so good because this honestly, um, explains like I would say maybe 75% of women in love or like with a crush they say your wife looked at you with a funny expression and this morning the mailman handed oh. you a letter from the IRS and crossed his fingers then you stepped in a pile of dog shit you saw two sticks on the sidewalk positioned like the hands of a watch they were whispering behind your back when you arrived at the office it doesn't matter what it means, it's still signifying. The yeah. sign that refers to other signs is struck with a strange impotence and uncertainty, but mighty is the signifier that constitutes the chain. The paranoiac yeah. shares the impotence of the deterritorialized sign, assailing him from every direction in the gliding atmosphere, but that only gives him better access to the super power of the signifier through the royal feeling of wrath as master of the network spreading through the atmosphere yeah I they are attacking me and making me suffer <laughs> yeah i'm glad you pulled that out because that's such a good fucking section yeah <laughs> and it really shows a good illustrator of like what the the variety the heterogeneity of things that we can mean when we say a sign yeah. all of those things signify yeah people whispering behind your back on the bus, it signifies something. And it's like, are they making fun of me? Are they not making fun of me? Well, it's like, oh, he looked at my stories. Does that mean he likes me? Oh, he didn't look at my stories. Yes. Does that mean he likes me too yes. much? Yes, <laughs> yes, perfect. All signifiers. <laughs> These are yeah. all signifiers. And like, literally, literally like- He I, took maybe... two days to respond to my text message. What yeah. does that mean? What does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean? Does he like me? Oh. Oh, he, he took three days to respond to me. That means he loves me because he's like trying to hold back. Oh, he responds to me immediately. That means he loves me because. <laughs> yeah, gotta... exactly. <laughs> and that's the paranoiac response. I think. That's, that's the paranoiac because what's important in paranoid structures, which is the same thing that's important in the signifying structure, 
his interpretation. And the split of subjectification. No, 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 that's, that's, okay. that's the most signifying. Okay. Okay. Don't okay. get ahead okay. of us. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the, the paranoid isn't split. Um, he interprets everything through his lens, right? Right, 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 and, right, right, right. And like, like it is like, um, I have some master delusion, right? That, that uh, uh, the government is spying on me. And now all of the signs out in the world, I interpret as signs that the government is in fact spying on me, a confirmation of the delusion. Um, my phone makes a buzzing noise before, there's like a, a, a delay before I'm able to connect to a call and it's like, that's a sign, you know? And I am able to interpret that sign into the regime, the signifying regime of my paranoia that I'm being watched by the CIA. Yeah. Well, and that just goes back into like conspiracy theories too. And like people like being obsessed with causality. I think maybe that like mode of being obsessed with A means B means C means D, like this sort of like linear kind of um, very arbitrary rationality of the paranoiac uh, feels very conspiratorial to me. Yeah, I think that's good. But I, I think we should focus on that word interpretation. Interpretation, yes. Because the, the way that they sort of draw out what the signifying regime is, is in the middle, you have like the master signifier, that's the king. And well, the immediate circle around the king is the priests or the yes, bureaucrats. Yes. And the main job of them is they have the most access to the doctrine and they are the most they interpret. Another no, way I was thinking that's of not, That's the post signifying regime, though. No, it's not. Uh, no, yeah, it's, not. it's the passional regime. No, it's definitely not. Mm -hmm. The priests, the priests are servants mm -hmm. of the king. Yes, yeah. yes. Look it up. Okay. You're you're not correct. All right, I'm okay with being wrong. That's fine. Um, yeah. Okay. So, oh yeah, you're right. The interpretive priest, the seer, is the is one of the despot gods bureaucrats. A new aspect of de deception arises. The deception yeah. of the priest interpretation is carried to infinity and never encounters anything to interpret that is not already in self an interpretation yeah. oh so that's Such okay a good line. yeah i actually have next to this i have like that's like definitely astrology right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The thing <laughs> I, the astrology the thing that i immediately thought of it was um in caesar's uh autobiography uh he talks about druid priests and how like, if you need someone to interpret what bird patterns means, you always get a druid, they're the best at it. Cause they would, they would tell fortunes based on bird flights and they would know whether to go into battle or not to, to go into battle based on signs from birds. Interesting. Or um, another way of deciding whether to go into battle or not is they would read chicken and trails. You, you cut a chicken open and the way the guts spill out tells you whether or not it's a good day to fight. Yeah, well, that's, that's really interesting that this is associated with the signifying regime because this is how Chinese um, characters actually developed through Oracle Bones. So they would take these turtle shells and then burn bones in the turtle shells. And the marks that were left were then taken to be icons icons to the real world and then interpreted based on its iconicity and thus um chinese characters developed out of that i love that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. there's a king in the center there's the priests and the interpreters and what i like about this too is um by interpreting they're always trying to make things match into the signifying regime the, the signifying regime is very closed and it's very stable. Well, so, yeah, be, because the, sig the signified is always like gliding around. I mean, you can, if you're the priest, you could really just be like, this means that. And I know because I'm the priest, right? Well, it, it fits back in with the, A, the conspiracy theorist, but the paranoid person, right? Like yes. everything is a sign of what they already believe. And the pre the interpretive priest is having the same function. Yeah, that they're fitting things into the regime, and it's based upon a tautology, this sort of circularity. It's like, oh, like he's a Taurus, so he likes to talk. He likes to talk because he's a Taurus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there's different circles going out, and this is like 
it's a way of organizing signs in a language, but it's also a way of organizing the signs of power in a literal despotic regime. Like, as much as the signifying regime applies to like particular functions of language, it also applies to like imperial powers, like kings. It's, it's literal and it's analogical, which is what Deleuze and DNG are always doing, which is what makes it so hard, but also so fun. Yeah, the, fuck a metaphor. Just, yeah, fuck yeah. a metaphor. It's literally both. <laughs> it's, it's not literally a metaphor. Both. <laughs> it's literally both. There's no such thing as representation. It's cre- yeah, <laughs> <laughs> representation. And so the next sort of factor of uh, the signifying regime is things that defy the signifying regime are allowed, but they're covered over with negativity and they're made into scapegoats. Yeah, and that's like a line of flight that's kind of stopped, right? Yeah. So yeah. well, so a line, it's a line of flight, a line of flight being an escape from, like we were saying, it's a very it's a rigid circle. system. Yeah. It's a very rigid system. It's a very rigid circle. The signs are all just interacting yeah. with other signs and it's always reinforcing, reinforcing, reinforcing. Mm-hmm. Anything yeah. that doesn't reinforce that becomes this way of escape from this circle is painted by the regime in a negative light. And they have this ceremony to be like, that thing that doesn't fit into our regime is wicked and we cast it out. It's not that it's leaving on its own accord, it's that we are throwing it out because it's bad. Right. Which is very clever, I like that a lot. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, like the whole like scapegoat idea, right? Yeah, because a scapegoat, the literal what a scapegoat was, was when you were making a sacrifice to the gods there was, you would sacrifice two goats. One goat you would kill, and the second goat you would just sort of set free out of the wilderness. And that was the scapegoat. You cast it out of society. Really? Yeah. What does this come from? Um, I think it's Greek. I think it's a Greek thing, but it might be, yeah, I think it's Greek. Okay. So yeah, the most famous scapegoat, I feel like the Jews have been just like scapegoated over and over again yes. throughout history. History's yeah. favorite scapegoat. History's favorite scapegoat, yes. Yeah, but you know, the metaphor of the scapegoat is now like the thing you kind of blame. Like you have a team project at work and it fucks up and you're like, uh, it was all Henry's fault. Henry sucks. I mean, the American scapegoat is communism, right? Because we see we see signs of like, like literal people like holding up signs during the civil rights movement when there was going to be like you know mixed schools or like in you know integration or whatever and people are saying like oh like that's communism or a classic Um, contemporary scapegoat russia Putin. yes everything that's bad in our society that doesn't fit into this despotic regime of signs anchored by the master signifier america and democracy is putin yeah, uh, um, yeah. It, well, because I mean, but that's just one step away from communism, though, because yeah, they were the yeah. old. I mean, they're just they were the old scapegoat, you know. And it's, it's interesting um, identifying any the scapegoat as communism really puts it in a different light. That thing we were talking about about some, seeing someone wear a mask and saying that the the mask is communism. Exactly. Exactly. Take that communism <laughs> out of the face. It's because it interrupts this like very fixed regime signifying regime of what it is to be an American is that you're free in very certain very prescribed ways and if you have to put on a mask it defies the signifying regime and thus has to be scapegoated it has to be labeled as communism yeah I mean we're stuck in this like signifying despotic regime right and and so so here's a another yeah, I mean, really America's good America's definitely imperial well, here's another really go- good quote about it that relates to my um, Animal Crossing critique and also last week when I said, um, but okay, so here it is. Nothing is ever over and done with in a regime of this kind. It's made for that. It's the tragic regime of infinite debt to which one is simultaneously debtor and creditor. I loved that. Um, I loved also the point they made that like, within the signifying regime, signs can't ever really disappear 
they lose. They can only get new meanings. Yeah, yeah. they can only be re-territorialized. Yeah. They lose what they used to mean, but then they reappear down the line meaning something else. And maybe that's like Putin is just like the Russo, the Russo, the contemporary lib Russophobia is just like a recycling of like anti-communism. 100%. Yeah, it was deterritorialized and then like brought back and re-territorialized and is now, you know, the line of flight again out as a scapegoat. Damn. Yeah. Um, are there any other aspects of the signifying regime? Um, hmm. Um, I, I think that um, this whole thing, this whole idea about like, um, vocalization in the face is really interesting oh yeah 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 the thing at the center that is the despot is also the face yeah the des that. the despot god has never hidden his face far from it he makes himself one or even several the mask does not hide the face it is the face the priest administers the face of god but the despot everything is public and everything that is public is so by virtue of the face i feel like that describes trump really really well, yeah. well they, yeah. they have a very specific notion of face that we'll get to in the faciality chapter mm. of like i don't know it yet because i haven't read it but my understanding of it from what i know is that it's like a face is something you become it's not something you have it's something out there for you that you like acquire within like a science system. That makes like, sense. Becoming white or becoming black, wearing a certain face. Oh, they do talk about blackface in here actually. Yeah, they did. They actually, I think they make an interesting point about, from, okay, they don't say, they don't use this term, but um, it's like the, the, ter the turn from blackface to cultural appropriation is actually the same turn as a signifying regime to a post-signifying regime. Mm. Uh, I'll, hold on, I have to find it. <laughs> well, yeah, I remember that section. Let's, should we talk post-signifying regimes? Yeah, let's talk post-signifying regimes. So a post-signifying regime is, it begins with a point of what they call a point of subjectification. And picture, if yeah. you will, on one of those circles of words orbiting around the king that we were talking about before, um, somewhere on that circle, there is a point and that point becomes significant to someone or something somehow. And thus from that moment of significance, a line, happens off of the circle, a line of flight. But this time, instead of it being scapegoated and saying that it's negative, this new line of flight or focus is now a path to be walked away. It's based on like the, the kind of Kafka idea of proceeding or indefinite postponement. Well, it's and one of it's the also, factors. Yeah, indefinite it's also indefinite postponement, also betrayal. Yeah. And a turning away of two faces. Yeah, they right? say instead of the ever present face in the middle, constantly looking at everything and everything referencing back to the face in the center, the first moment of this line is a turning away, two faces looking away from each other. Right. And the example they use is the, the, the sort of anchoring example of this whole thing is the uh, Moses and the, the Israelites leaving Egypt because Egypt uh, uh, of the Pharaoh is a classic signifying regime. It's imperial, it's despotic, and the Israelites are a post-signifying regime. They leave, they create new meanings as they go, and it starts with the God of the Jews. You turn, you, can't, you don't look at the face of God. Moses doesn't look at the face of God. Moses sees God's backside as he walks past. Uh, but the face of God is not right. something to be seen. It, not in the way that the Pharaoh is a face that is to be seen. God's face is not to be seen. Yeah. Okay. So here, so earlier when I was like, you like corrected me, which is really good. Here's, here's the line. Here's the line where I was wrong. Okay. 
So um, the prophet, so the prophet is the figure. Not to be confused with the priests. Yes, the exactly. The prophet is not a priest. The prophet does not know how to talk. God puts the word in his mouth, almost like a puppet animation. Okay, animation theory. Ah, <laughs> uh, nice tie-in. Um, excellent, excellent. Um, word, word ingestion, a new form of semiophagy. Unlike the seer, the prophet interprets nothing. His delusion is active rather than ideational or imaginative. His relation to God is passional, keyword, and authoritative rather than despotic and signifying. He anticipates and detects the powers of the future rather than applying the past present powers. Faciality traits no longer function to prevent the formation of a, of a line of flight or to form a body of significance controlling that line and sending only a faceless goat down it. Rather, it is faciality itself that organizes the line of flight in the face-off between the uh, countenances that become gaunt and turn away in profile. Betrayal has become the idea fixed, the main obsession, replacing the deceit of the paranoiac and the hysteric. The persecutor-persecuted relation has no relevance whatsoever. Its meaning is altogether different in the authoritarian, passional regime um, than in the despotic, paranoid regime. Yeah. Of the of the Simple. signifying. Why should we yeah. even say anything else? It's all right there. <laughs> yeah. I'm not gonna lie. Some of the specifics of what they considered factors of this, the signifying regime made a lot more sense to me. Yeah, the signifying regime I think makes the most sense out of all of this. Um, yeah. because that's what I think that's just what we're used to. That's like the ground that we've been, you know, well, raised upon. I think we're we're at all times kind of both. Because signifying mm. and post-signifying regimes kind of meld with each other all the time. That, like he was saying, the the Israelites are post-signifiers to the degree that they're leaving Egypt, but also like seek to establish signifying regimes when they return to Israel and set, set up re rebuild the temple and set up their own king. Here's another quote, Christianity is a particularly important case of a mixed semiotic with its signifying imperial combination together with its post-signifying Jewish subjectivity. Yeah, let's, let's before we get into mixes and things like that, let's, oh. let's try our best to flesh out what the post-signifying regime is. Because it's okay. very, it's, the face turns away from the face. Yeah, so it's about uh, facelessness, it's about, um, not interpreting, but actually uh, being animated, being a puppet for the word of God. Um, What's well, it's it's linear, passional. It's a yeah, segmented it's linear. Line. That's true. That's yeah. important because it's it's not circles based around the center. It's one line right. moving, and the line is broken up into small segments based on events or something. Right. Um. And so it's, I think it's significant that they, they call the post, the post signifying regime, they also call the subjective regime. The regime of subjectivization. Right. And so it's like, when you leave on this line of flight that becomes the linear post signifying regime, you know, when the Israelites leave Egypt, uh, he says, two subjects are established the subject of enunciation and the subject of the statement. And um, you can either, one person can be both of them or like in the case of analysis, the patient can be the subject of the enunciation while the analyst is the subject of the statement. And my understanding of what this means and the way they're using it is the subject of enunciation is the one who speaks. The person exactly. speaking, whereas exactly. the subject of the statement is the I, like the, the letter I, when you say something like, I am this way, I do this, I love you, the subject of the statement is the thing that fits into a larger set of uh, signs and things that make okay. the statement possibly true or false. 
so I feel like they have a really good example of that here. And thank God, thank God, French and English are so similar so that we could like get close to the meaning that they're getting to. Because I feel like if something like this was written in Chinese and we we're reading in translation, we'd have no fucking clue. But so they mention D and G. They say that like this is very much and in English we use this all the time. For instance, you say like, oh, you know, when you go out and do X, Y, Z. And when I say that you, I'm not referring to you, Woody. I'm referring to you in like the kind of like universal. I could I could replace that you with I, because they have this constant. They're constantly talking about shifters, which is a fan. I mean, that's a, shifters is actually a simpler word for dictics, which is just like pronouns that are changing, right? So so for instance, so I use you as like a universal you, which actually is kind of like an I, but is put on to someone else in Chinese that in Chinese that does not exist I would never say like I would never say that no yeah yeah, that does, yeah that's very much that's very rooted in like some sort of um Indo-European expression yeah but yeah but what they're talking about is this sort of doubling of like I'm speaking but I can have anyone as the subject of the sentence and I can say you, but it could also that when I say you, it could mean me. It could mean you specifically. It could mean you as universal. I think I think it's also very helpful to bring in this distinction they make between what they call a mental, the mental reality, and the dominant reality. Oh, okay. I don't know and, anything about that, so tell me. And they're saying that like the subject of the enunciation kind of works and creates a, a certain mental reality certain ideas about yourself. The subject of the statement is dealing with a dominant reality larger than itself. Um, I'm, my dog is barking. I'm going to let <laughs> keep talking. Oh. Hold on, the dog's barking. The, the dominant reality is a set of conditions larger than the subject himself uh, through which you can like decide whether what is being said is true or not. Like, um, if I say something as simple as, like, I am eight feet tall, I say that I am eight feet tall, um, there is a reality outside of me by which that statement can be judged as either true or false. We have something that is known as foot, the unit of measure. We have a numeral known as eight, and I combine the two of them to see whether or not I am, in fact, eight feet. We know what tall means. We, because of the dominant linguistic reality, this, there's the signs involved. We're able to uh, judge what I said based on the regimes. Blana's got a cute dog. Sorry, this Mommy is our mascot. This is our mascot. <laughs> yeah. I can hear you. Um, yeah, sorry. If our mascot not, has just. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you're not watching the live stream, you're missing a lot of very good puppy time. Oh, you bit the mic. He loves the mic. He lives for it. You do, huh, baby? He's a little Who's a baby? star. Oh, <laughs> Who's a baby, huh? Who's a sweet little baby boy? Do you need to go pee or what? Why are you being naughty, huh? You so much of a child, Pian. You don't got mad. You should sign it out, Anyway. Sorry. Um, last time, last time I ignored my dog, he ate like a six pronged um, Phillips light strip like connector and then i had to take him to get multiple x-rays and so you uh, have to pay attention and, to him now yeah um sorry so <laughs> the subject of the enunciation and the subject of the statement are constantly collapsing into each other and as you move along this line this segmented line of discrete uh events discrete happenings they collapse into each other first one, then the other. Subject of statement, subject mental reality clashes with um, the dominant reality in one way or another. It's interesting that even though um, the signifying regime is the more rigid, the post signifying regime is where they ground, where they say Foucault's concept of normalization exists. Oh, I miss that. Can you, ex can you explain Foucault's concept of normalization, actually? So Foucault's concept of normalization is bringing into 
practice, uh, but it, like making something fit a dominant norm. Like, um, let's say I have a little box and I can only fit round pegs through it. And then something comes along that's a square peg. The process of normalization is shaving off those corners so that it's round and I can fit it Got into the it. box. Got but it. you know, that concept of normalization is applied by Foucault to concepts of psychology and like what we define as mental illness. And his point is we first begin by establishing something that we call normal. The normal is not given. The normal is not some universal handed down by God to us. It's it's a con historically contingent sense of what's normal, and it has to do with the structure of the society we find ourselves in. And usually, it has to do with um, helping that society move quicker or better. Right, and so that's actually that. I mean, that's D and D's critique of um, Oedipus. Really, is that it's like very much this sort of ideology that's been like passed on by Freud and then normalized, and then now people are like, you know, internalizing. I mean, I think this is back then when people were more bought into the Freud ideology or whatever. But yeah, I yeah, mean, the thing things weren't allowed to freely roam. I think I think Oedipus is a signifying regime, right? He's sort of the despot in the center, and everything has to be interpreted to be in line with Oedipus. Well, he so Oedipus represents the colonization of the family. Yeah, by Oedipal constructs. Uh, yeah, yeah, by by means of the psychoanalyst, like the complete colonization. I mean, that this is an anti-Oedipus. Sorry, I won't. I won't. Uh, I won't. Yeah, stick to the stick to the matter at hand, Lana. We have enough to talk about. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For I'm God's like, sake. I'm just I'm like really worried about Patois or trash put mascot right now. Uh, put him in his little cage. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get him back and put him in his cage. Yeah. You're very cute. We'll show him again. He, look how cute he is. Lana, they can't see. It's a podcast. <laughs> You're so cute. You're so cute. This is You're very cute for the six people that watch the live stream. Oh, um, he's recording. Okay. Um, so okay. it's also, it's odd that, um, the post-signifying regime is where they ground authoritarianism. I guess, I guess my question is, what's the difference between a despot and an authoritarian? I am not entirely sure. That's why it's so weird that they would ground one here. And I think maybe in a post-signifying regime, there's a lot more self-regulation. Yeah, well, okay, so... You hold, your, you hold yourself to a dominant reality as opposed to being um, subjected your, to it by a despot. You are your own despot, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> that's very like panopticon meets like societies of control, I feel like. Well, I mean, Deleuze wrote societies of control. No, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. I, I assigned it in my class for next week, even though it's like not relevant at all. <laughs> so I'm like, you guys need to read this. Because you're the teacher, baby. I'm the teacher. Because I'm the despot. I'm the despot. So they have to, or I'm, am I the authoritarian? So that's, that's the best I can do to explain the post-signifying regime in the abstract, um, which I don't feel like made a lot of sense. Do you have anything, I, like, factors of it? I think um, I probably need to read more. I think there's this very interesting idea that they have about the di di diagrammatic mode. Oh, which that's later. Is very let's not get to that yet. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's let's round out. Um, because what I I wanted to round out the post signifying with um. Okay. Uh, some so examples they, so, that were so actually they, very helpful. Yeah. So they say that the post signifying regime is about consciousness related or mimetic functions, right? Yeah. And so mimetic functions. So if we're talking about mimetic functions, that I think opens up a whole. Well, I think I think it's more 
individual, right? Like, uh, like, or more particular, because it starts with like this point of subjectivization and then it has its whole thing. My, what the example that really clicked the post signifying for me was um, that like fetish formations mm. are on this, uh, this regime of signs. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're in the signifying regime, you're in the big regime, and then this point of subjectivization is that like a foot or like a shoe or like a dress and it becomes this fixation and starts this whole new regime of signs going off of it and within one person there can be several points of subjectivization creating different lines of subjectivization different post signifying regimes that uh, like create one subjecthood of it you know I need to, I need to, I see feet and I get horny. That's part of it. But I also have this thing of like, what I really like in a woman is a good smile. And the mm -hmm. smile is this other point of subjectivization that things spring off of for me. And like, they create their own segmented things through time. But meanwhile, I'm like speaking the King's English, which is a, uh, despotic formation with the the oxford english dictionary in the center um so yeah yeah there's something interesting about they keep talking about the input so they relate like they say that the passional like passional societies or like something like passional the passional regime is the post-signifying regime right yeah, it's the passional regime yeah and so there's something interesting there i think oh i like that i like this line a lot every consciousness so this is um this is talking about the post the post-signifying regime and they say that like resonance is the mode of the the post-signifying regime that um Subjectification essentially constitutes finite linear proceedings, one of which ends before the next begins. Thus, the cogito, the co is that how you pronounce cogito, it? Cogito, yeah. Yeah, cogito, is always recommend, rec recommenced. A passion or grievance is always recapitulated. Every consciousness pursues its own death, every love passion its own end. By yeah. attraction. Cogito being cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Yeah, Descartes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All about like, like being, being, being obsessed with like being lost in your own mind. This has to do with like, honestly, like, I, so this is where I get like confused because the signifying regime is all about interpretation. But at the same time, I can see how this sort of post signifying regime could also be obsessed with kind of like an endless interpretation, right? Because every consciousness pursues its own death, every the cogito like ev every love passed in its own end attracted by a black hole and all the black holes resonate together thus sub subjectification imposes on the line of flight a segmentarity that is forever repudiating that line and upon absolute deterioration deterritorialization a point of abolition that is forever blocking that deterritorialization or diver diverting yeah. and that's that's the thing about is something that they're not trying to do is they're not trying to say signifying regime good bad post signifying good yeah yeah there's no good or bad right there's no good or bad and <laughs> yeah, there's not no. a transformation of one it's um they're both just discrete things that we interact with often at the same time and um the uh sorry Sorry, um, my dog is being so bad. Patel, our mascot is being so bad right now. The different, like oh. the <laughs> Deleuze and Guattari, something that they're really looking for is they're looking for they're looking for ways out. They're looking for true lines of flight. They're looking from escapes from the dominant system, and so the while the post signifying regime may seem like a way out, like a line of flight, it's still blocked because it's like this segmented thing. It's still like got this authoritarian quality. And so it's not what they would consider truly deterritorialized, true line of flight. Um, what they consider to be more true is what 
a true instrument of change or moving forward is what they call an abstract machine. And this is where I got real lost and it all stopped making sense to me. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I like was like, for a second I was reading this as like, honestly, like love life advice. And I was like, hell yeah, like super into it. And then when they got to the abstract machines, I was like, I don't, I'm not following anymore. Why is it love life advice? Because they say that like, for instance, subjectification, um, subjectification carries desire to such a point of excess and unloosening that it must either annihilate itself in a black hole or change planes. And so it's like, okay, then the answer to this is like, and love to not like subjectify it, right? Or to well, not it is like- subjectified. <laughs> That's the whole line is you subjectified something. This, this is like um, the post-structural aspect because the signifying regime is, is structuralism, right? Right. And this is where it is like, these things are represented in the Israelites in certain cultures, but it's also very, very the, the more personal is like um, these, the ways that you personally interact with something and, this, and form this line of flight out is like the subjectivizing. But of course, a paranoid structure, a paranoid regime is also very personal. It's, it's your various interpretations of things that are coming to get you. So yeah. I don't really know. But yeah, they start- yeah. Also, I think what's interesting about this too is because like, so especially in anti-Oedipus, they're like very much romanticizing the figure of the schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. And so, but actually I think in like real medicine, we're talking about a paranoid schizophrenic. Right. Well, they they are. <laughs> Deleuze was working with real schizophrenics. He just thinks it's cool. <laughs> just like yeah, that's tight. There's not. It's not good. It's not helpful to make a distinction between some kind of like medicalized schizophrenic and like what they're saying about schizophrenia. They are talking about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's part of the debate of Deleuze and Guattari is, is it irresponsible to hold schizophrenia to some like higher and um, even just like schizoanalysis and like the schizophrenic as model, how livable is that going forward as a model? Yeah. Because the whole thing of it is like, we can say, I mean, one of my critiques of it is like, we can say normalization, we can say this, but like, as I've said before on the pod, just because something's arbitrary doesn't mean it's not significant. Yeah. And it's like, you might have new ways of thinking opened up or like breaks from regimes of signs or breaks from regimes of power opened up if you embrace schizophrenia or like the schizophrenic uh, discourse. But like, if you go too far into schizophrenia that you can't hold a job, then you're in trouble, bud. Right, right. You get yourself up shit creek. Right. It's all well and good when you're Deleuze and Guattari. Let's let's wrap up. Sorry, yeah, Patois, our our mascot is just like not even. He's yeah, he's 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 becoming a, a paranoid schizophrenic right now. He's a schizophrenic on a walk. Yeah, he's a schizophrenic on a walk. I'm sorry. I knew, I knew, I knew it was a bad sign to bring it back to the sign. I knew it was a bad sign when he was being super good all day. Mm, it means he was <laughs> saving it. Yeah, yeah, and like be naughty early in the day. <laughs> they close the chapter out by talking about abstract machines, which they see as being possible for really true new change, new things to really start. And I honestly had no idea what they were talking about. I was trying to figure it out too. And like, um, I thought at first, like, are they talking about like, sort of like categories, like grammar or something, but- Well, the specific example they use is musicians. The specific Mm -hmm. example they use is like, when a new, when a composer invents a new style of music. Hmm like a like a the rite of spring being some sort of like abstract machine that creates new yeah and then from there they talk a little about like a schizoanalysis of a pragmatic way of like looking at regimes of science and it's sort of about like 
looking at what they do, but also seeing how different, how the regimes are transformed into each other, how right. they're mixed, but also how they're transformed into each other and how different mixes and different maps of transformations open up possibilities, lines of flights, ways of ways out. That, trans that transformation idea is very interesting to me because I have constantly been teaching my students what, um, so uh, Roman Jakobson has a term which is called transmutation or intersemiotic translation. And in industry, I think branding actually, branding is all about intersemiotic translation or transmutation. And, I, and my question is, is like, is this different from what D and G are talking about? I think it is, but like transmutation or like um, this sort of intersemiotic like translation, uh, what that means is like, for instance, I make this song and this song has a certain affect or this certain expression. And then I'm gonna translate that expression or affect into a visual medium, into like a cover art. And then I'm gonna translate that into uh, a product that I'm going to sell to you and I'm going to translate that into um, the UI for a game that I'm going to make that's going to have to do with my album or like you know what I mean like it goes on forever. I think maybe there's an aspect of that in there but I think with transformation they're even talking about like if I say I love you and like how that shifts from being like signifying, post-signifying, nomadic, or counter depending on different situations, or even just me at different times. I don't know. I think we'll figure this out more as we read the other things. Yeah, it's good to have questions. Like, we don't have to answer them now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what did we learn from this? What did we learn from this? What's our takeaway? What's your, you start first, what's your takeaway? Um, God, what is my takeaway? I like the, I like certain aspects of these models. I like very much the way of thinking about the signifying regime. Um, and that, that, that example of like thinking of it as like an imperial structure was very helpful to me. And then these sort of like lines of betrayal out. I think that my takeaway is going to be very practical for the ladies and the men at home, which is that like to be ever interpretive about like whether or not he likes you or whether or not he ever loves you or whatever, whatever, like, like that is like a paranoid line of thinking and you're, you're never going to be able to land on a signified like you're never going to be able to know and so to even keep grasping for some sort of um meaning about love or about anything <laughs> at all related to some sort of uh paranoiac uh fueled relationship is um an empty endeavor and instead maybe you should turn your face away and look for a prophet <laughs> Oh, interesting. <laughs> Except I'm going to go on further and say, become a true paranoiac and you'll always know the answer. Oh, wow. There we go. I if like you're that. truly paranoid, then signs won't be ambiguous. You'll always know. You'll, you'll always be completely insane, but you'll know what's going on. I guess as long as you're sure within your own heart, that's all that matters. <laughs> Right Keep it in your heart, you paranoid angel. This is this is the center of subjectification. Yeah, I've got a face in my little in my little chest. Yeah, before before we even uh, take take flight on that post signifying regime, we uh, we first know, right? Oh here. damn! We didn't, we didn't even get to talk about mania and monomania. But oh yeah, erotomania too. We can do yeah. without it, I think. The erotic, uh, yeah, the erotomania and monomania just like gave me a lot of clarity. But yeah, if you want to know about that, you can just Google it. Okay. Read the damn book. <laughs> you know, uh, we can is good too. We can do our best, but at the end of the day, you gotta read the damn book, people. Also, we don't know anything. Like, don't trust us. <laughs> oh yeah, we're dumb as hell as always. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We know everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can put all the stuff, smart stuff that we know on the Patreon. So if you want to really learn, you gotta get... <laughs>
Yes. Yes, honey. City baby. Um, well, that's it for me. It's hot <laughs> as hell and I'm sweating my ass off. Yeah, me too. And my dog is like chewing everything that he shouldn't be. So, all, all right. right. <laughs> next time. Until next time. Stay trashy. Stay trashy.